is. Hello. Okay. My name is Lara Johnson. Welcome back to the Busy Moms Book Club. And this month we are doing Big Magic um, from Elizabeth Gilbert. I love this book. I also love the color because it's really bright and pretty and a little sassy kind of how I feel like I am. So a little bit about me, and then, um, we'll jump right into the book. Um, I'm a certified life coach. I help Christian moms, um, specifically discover and become who they're meant to be and answer their God given, uh, calling that they have in this, on this life in this life. Um, I've got three kids ranging from 10 all the way to three. Um, I've been married for gosh, what, 12 years, 13 years. I don't even know, (laughs) but I'm pretty lucky. I have an amazing husband that I adore and he drives me crazy at the same time. So we all have a really good time. Uh, I'm just letting one other person in real quick. Um, so what I love to do to always kick off um, the beginning of the book club is, uh, you know, you're in the right place if, (laughs) so that's just what we're going to call it. So, um, you know that you are in the right place for this book club is if you've ever felt like you don't have any passions in life, um, like you have a passionless life. Um, another way, you know, you're in the right book club is if you tell others that you're just not a creative person. Um, if you've ever felt like you do have a lot of ideas, but you feel stuck in moving forward with those ideas. Um, another thing is if you hate filling out questionnaires that, um, ask about yourself, like ask about you, um, asking about your gifts or talents, um, or if you get a lot of ideas, like you're always in the idea, like you're, you consider yourself a really big dreamer, but there's no doing to it. So you're a big dreamer, but you feel like you lack the doing, like the bringing it out into the world. So typically what happens, especially with my clients, because this is where we spend a lot of our time is in this place of learning who we are and being able to tap into our creativity. And at this point, this is typically when my clients, what they've done in the past is they've told themselves like, oh, I'll just wait till my kids get a little bit older. And then their kids get older and then they have no passions. They have nothing that really makes them come alive. Or they'll tell themselves like, I just need a hobby. I just need to volunteer more. And then they spend all their energy outside of them, not doing things that really light them up. Um, The other thing that I see my clients do all the time is they cover up this insecurity with sarcasm. And I actually used to be a really good pro. (laughs) It's like any of those stinking questionnaires. Oh, I hated them. Maybe it was just like in my twenties when I was, you know, working, applying for jobs, they came up more, but I would always answer with things like, I make a really mean top ramen, or I can ride a tube down a hill in the snow. You know, like it was really because I just was really insecure about not having these passions. I see this come up in my clients all the time as they use sarcasm to, to cover that up. Um, and then also the other thing that I realized that I, I watch my clients do is they are so like drawn to something that it becomes painful. So they start cleaning more and they start um, caring more about their kids. It's like, they can't bring this pain out of them. Like this thing that wants to come out. So they just start layering things to keep themselves busy. So they don't ever have to look at that fear of being insignificant or not answering that calling. So tell me, you can go over to the comments if that resonates with you at all, if any of those things or things that you do to remedy remedy it, Um, because I think we all do it. I know I have (laughs) for many years until I really understood how to tap into it. And that's what I really liked about um, Elizabeth Gilbert about this book, Big Magic. Um, Nicole here. Oh, hi, Nicole. Um, Plenty of ideas, but lack and follow through very common that I think is like the hardest part. And so she addresses that in the book and that's what we're going to talk about. So what are the things that, um, she talks about, um, in the very beginning is she gives us a, a a cautionary question. We're going to call it. Okay. So she says, do you have the courage So I'll, I'll finish it, but I just, I want you to write this down. Oh, and if you don't have a pen and paper, you know, go and grab one. Cause you'll want to take notes. Um, if you're in a place to do so. Um, okay. So she starts, do you have the courage to bring forth the treasures that are hidden within you? <laughs> like right out of the gate, like she 
Ooh, she goes deep. <laughs> uh, but I love it. The right at the very beginning, she talks about how the universe and, and for me, you know, I, I use universe and, and on God kind of, um, that's a lot of people talk about universe. I believe it's God. So let's just clear that up. When I talk about universe, you know, I really do believe there's universal laws that God has created. So what she talks about in this book is, is that to the universe or God, as I imagine it, um, he has planted treasures within every single one of us, like hidden gifts and talents, and then sits back to see if we have the courage enough to discover those, to dig down deep and, and realize the hidden treasures that lay within every single one of us. And to be clear, for the longest time, I thought I was the outlier and I didn't have gifts and I didn't have talents because they didn't look like other people. I don't sing. I don't draw. Clearly my handwriting's horrible. <laughs> like I could barely draw a stick figure. Like that was not my strong suit. And so it was really challenging for me to think I was not a creative person that I therefore did not have any gifts and talents, but as children of God, every single one of us has this planted within us. The difference is if we have the courage to bring it forth, um, into the world and, and to move forward on that. So I think it's important to really come back to this question every single time big magic happens. And we'll talk about what that means. There are, there's no such thing as, as a non-creative person and a creative person. We all have creativity that exists within us. The only difference is courage. And so really think about that as, as we move through this, um, you found that statement interesting. Yeah. It really, it like really dug down, um, deep to me. So, um, Ansi, you can share a little thoughts if you would like to, about what you thought made it, um, interesting. So she lists five things with like a bonus six, which was pretty short about, um, how to, uh, how to live. Um, she calls it creative living. Okay. So these are the five things. And we're going to talk about each of these five things. And then the bonus little sixth one. So she talks about how the first one is courage. Okay. And, and we kind of preface that a little bit. The next one is enchantment. I just think that's a fun word. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, it really elicits, um, a lot of happy feelings for me, a very childlike type feeling, um, persist, uh, permission persistence, uh, and no oh, trust, excuse me. And then the bonus six one, we'll just put a plus, um, is divinity. Okay. So I want you to write each of these down. Um, while I read, um, what Ansi says, I've always considered myself a non-creative person. Yes. I was in that space for a very long time. And it was interesting because I wrote something on, on social media not long ago. And one of my friends had commented, like, you're a very creative person. Um, you are a writer. And I was like, hold up. <laughs> that was a new thought. I have never thought that about myself whatsoever. It, it, it like blew my mind. This was about a year ago, it, like blew my mind. But then I realized like, oh, I am very creative. I just never gave myself the permission to be a creative person in my own way. So we're going to talk more about that. Um, so thank you, Ansi, for sharing that, because I think a lot of people can relate to not thinking of themselves as a creative person and recognizing that courage, uh, as well as these other steps is really the, the differentiating factor there. So she goes on to say, um, creative living, the way she defines it again, is there are treasures that are buried deep inside each of us. And it's up to us to see if we can find them, if we can hunt and uncover them, that's what creative living is. And one thing that she talks about here is that, um, and we'll talk about it more, I think later on, but she talks about in order to be, um, a creative person, you have to be willing to, um, follow curiosity instead of fear. And that's hard to do. Like, let's talk about that for a second. Fear is, uh, is, is human. Um, to be fearful is to be human. If we don't have fear, 
then there's something wrong with our brain. Like, honestly. So the only difference is that like, imagine, uh, imagine we each have a microphone and we're giving our, um, the microphone of our brain to other people. When we are living a creative life, what we're doing is essentially giving the microphone of our brain to curiosity instead of fear. Fear will still exist, but it's not the loudest voice in our head. Curiosity is. And when we're following that curiosity, it is very um, childlike. Like I think about in the, in the scriptures where it talks about um, becoming like a little child, oftentimes we think about that in terms of forgiveness or faith, but also think about how so many children are very curious. They are exploring the world from, from new eyes, from a, a completely different perspective. And that's kind of fun to think about that that when we're following our curiosity, this is when we are the most creative. And this is when we're able to engage in what she calls big magic. So when we are engaging in, in, well, I think, I think big magic is better explained in enchantment. So we'll go there in a second. I want to finish what she, what she talks more about, about fear. She says, everyone has excuses Um, The only difference is the more you argue for your fear or your limitations or your excuses, the more you get to keep them. And it's for me, I use those excuses a lot to hold myself back in my life. Uh, I felt like I didn't have an easy life. There was sexual abuse in my, in my past. Um, I, my husband works really crazy hours. My oldest son is autistic. Like, like I kept pulling all of these things to show like, Hey, this is the hard life I have. And therefore it's harder for me to do these things. But the more I put them at the forefront of who I was, the more I could not discover my own gifts and talents. And that was a very different, a different shift that happened in my body when instead of using those as my excuses, they were the reasons and and the very things that shaped who I am that make me into the person that I've become and able to use and and discover and use the gifts that I have. The other thing she talks about, which I I really love, (laughs) she talks about how fear is so boring. Like it's like, so basic. <laughs> like you hear that, word. like it's going to show up no matter what, doesn't matter what you do. You can always count on fear. It's like the good old, like friend that you don't want to hang out with, but they're just there. <laughs> like, sorry, this is like a really bad example, but it's the one that's coming to my mind right now. Um, there was an individual that I knew when I was doing service for my church and he was really great, but he just, we just didn't mesh outside of like when I had come home and I was no longer doing service for my church, but we had kept in touch and, and he kind of invited himself to our wedding and <laughs> like, no joke, every picture, every picture for my wedding, there he is. <laughs> like, like there's me and my husband with a group of people and there's his face. <laughs> like that's what I kind of think of, um, with fear is it kind of feels like the lurker, the person that you're not really comfortable with, and you haven't yet learned how to speak those boundaries on like, no, you're just not coming to my wedding. Um, that's really what I think about fear being fear will always be there. Super boring plan on it happening. Um, and the reason it will get louder is when you are triggering your creativity and the only way to really work with it is to talk with fear and to have those conversations and to set those boundaries that, Hey, you don't get the mic. You don't get to speak the loudest in my brain. You can be here, but you're not going to be in the driver's seat. I need you to go sit in the corner. And it sounds very funny to think about, um, talking to our emotions like that. But the reason why I I believe that's such an important thing to do is because it separates who we are and and the spirit and the soul that we have as a child of God from the natural man. And you can have those conversations with yourself in your mind every single time. What it does is it gives the microphone back to your soul and your spirit, the one that is tapping into the divinity that you have and, and the inspiration that's coming from God away from the natural man that wants to keep you safe and secure, but also not creating your purpose on this earth. 
so it's really important to recognize the difference there and to make peace essentially with fear. So she goes on to say, so this is really the courage step is, is following that curiosity instead of fear. And remember, um, courage is feeling fear and not letting it control you. Like you still being in control. That is courage. I used to think people that were courageous, um, it felt good. <laughs> I've since learned that is not the case. <laughs> Courage does not feel good. <laughs> okay. So let's just get really clear that as you're moving forward to your, to your most creative self, it won't always feel pleasant. And being able to make that agreement with yourself is how you go from a non-creative person to a creative person. And, and I really saw that shift in me was when I was willing to feel not really comfortable and put myself out there. I discovered my gifts and talents on a completely different level. That's when you start finding that buried treasure that she talks about within each of us. Okay. So we went through courage next one enchantment. So I actually, like I mentioned before, um, I, I like this phrase enchantment because it feels very, um, whimsical to me, I, I guess is, is the way to describe it. Um, when I'm thinking about inspiration, so she talks about how, um, actually I want to read her words because I think, I think they're really interesting on this. Okay. So she talks about how ideas work. She says, I believe that creativity is a force of enchantment, not entirely human in its origins. She said, I believe that our planet is inhabited not only by animals and plants and bacteria and viruses, but also by ideas. Ideas are disembodied energetic life form. They are completely separate from us, but capable of interacting with us. She, she says, she goes on to say, ideas are driven by a single impulse to be made manifest. She said, and the only way to, um, the only way an idea can be made manifest in our world is through collaboration with a human partner. So oftentimes, especially when I'm thinking about this in terms of, of God and, and our spiritual selves, like, like how, like I, I asked myself, like, how does that fit and does it fit? And I, I truly do believe that it does fit that these ideas are, are God's way of of bringing joy and happiness to his children. And he will allow, uh, he will allow these ideas to collaborate with us so that we can live our purpose and he can fulfill his purpose. And so when I was thinking about how that meshes and, and the whimsical of that, it really is tapping into, um, something beyond us. And, and that's really what she talks about in, in this section of the book is that when we're getting to this spot, we have these ideas and inspiration and they will hit you like a, like a lightning bolt. I don't know if you've ever like think for a moment, um, when, if you've ever had those moments where like, like, you know, deep in your soul, something shifted. Um, I knew the moment I was to become a life coach. I had already been looking for it. I didn't have a name for it. And it was like the moment that like really came in inside of my body. It was a huge shift. Now I didn't act on it for a very long time because it freaked me out. <laughs> like I was not, I was not certain that that was the, the right path for me. And so I questioned it for a little while. We're going to talk about that, but when we get these ideas and inspiration, it's almost like the lightning bolt, like flows all the way through our body, you know, like in the movies when they're like electrocuted, that's kind of what it feels like. And she describes it as like this intensity, the chills, the hair on the back of your neck. And there's been times even after, you know, in my business where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm onto something. <laughs> like you, it's like, you get really excited. You're like, what is happening? You're like channeling this idea through. So she said, at this point, you have two options when the idea comes and asks to collaborate with you. Okay. And again, I, I believe these are ideas from God, inspiration from God, you have a choice in the matter. And I think it's important to realize and, and accept that we have responsibility and choices we get to make in this moment. Uh, so she said, you have the option to either say yes or no, you get to make that decision. 
And she said, if the answer is no, the idea moves on to find its other person to collaborate with. Oh, not one idea moves on, excuse me. She said, but if you say yes, then you enter into a contract with it. You then become responsible for bringing it out into the world. Now, there have been lots of ideas where I knew they were really great ideas. So I, I think I've mentioned this before. Um, I used to have a nonprofit. We raised money for terminally ill parents. I knew I was onto something, that there was a huge need to fulfill. But it got to the point where at that moment, it would take exponential amounts of personal growth and growth within the nonprofit for it to no longer take away from my family. And that was a really hard decision to make. And I remember at one point praying and saying, I really want to help these people, but it, it's coming at a cost of my family uh, because I wasn't making money. And it was taking me away because these there were, there were dire circumstances and it was, it was hard to get to that point. But I remember like essentially turning it back over to God and saying like, I need you to take care of these people. This is not something I'm going to continue on. Now that moment was life-changing for me because it was as though I felt God, like it, it almost like he blessed that decision that it was like, it was in the cards all the time. And he had just let me hold it for a little bit. And he took that back. And I trusted that everybody that I would have helped, he now was, was in charge. I mean, he was always in charge, but he, he took that responsibility off of my shoulders, that, that mantle of responsibility off of my shoulders and the idea moved on. But what I learned from that was everything in preparation for the next phase of my life and what I, what I was going to do. So then when I had the prompting to become a life coach, you know, that inspiration, that, that idea that to collaborate for moms and helping them figure, um, like who they're meant to be in God's eyes, all of that idea came from the nonprofit. And I, I remember the moment it came was because I had this thought of I'm helping a few people before they pass. What about the millions of moms that need help while they're living, that they are living almost a, from a place of not being alive inside. And it was like, God took one from me and planted another one in like, it was the strangest. It, it sounds so weird to even say out loud. You're probably the first people, people that have ever heard this out loud, honestly, um, because suddenly I entered in a, to a completely different contract to, instead of help the few to help the thousands and the millions is, is what I truly do believe I'm, I'm creating with my business. And that at that moment, I entered into that contract with this idea and I trusted God. And, and we'll talk more about trust in a minute. And I trusted that this was the next step and that it was a choice that I was choosing to make and to go into the collaboration. So he said, uh, she says in this book is that oftentimes as your idea grows, sometimes things will get sidetracked. There's lots of things that I haven't followed through on. Um, sometimes the ideas go away. I've had, <laughs> I think we can all say like, we've had ideas that have come and go. Um, and then sometimes they move on to other people. She said, oftentimes our ideas don't want to wait around. And really I, I am grateful that the idea for my life coaching business, as it is today, uh, I didn't act on it. And I am grateful that idea did not move on. There have been other things that have moved on and that's in a way it's sad because I wasn't ready for it. So I've really committed to myself long ago that no matter what I would put myself in a position where I could be ready for the inspiration that would come from God. And I could be in a spot to act on it because I did put it off for so many years, um, because I had a lot of self-doubt. And so being able to hear her voice talk about this and, and how those ideas do move on, um, it's important to recognize that, that that can happen to us and it doesn't have to be, I guess, necessarily painful, but it can be a learning opportunity and a place that, um, almost a gratitude that you got to engage with it in the first place. 
she does share um, a really cool experience about a book she had um, in the story where she had this whole book and it, and she got sidetracked in her life and the idea moved on, but it moved on to somebody else where the other person started to write the identical book to the idea she had originally, which is so cool. And so as soon as I read that part in the book, um, I immediately went to my husband because we've had this conversation where he has lots of ideas all the time. And it, it's like, it's become a joke within about a year he'll see a billboard for a company advertising the very thing he outlined on a piece of paper. And so as soon as I read that in the book, I went up to my husband. I was like, the ideas are leaving you. <laughs> like you got to have courage to jump on these. Like every single one of these is, is meant for you. And you haven't entered into a contract and you know, he's, he's um, an accountant. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like he doesn't quite um, appreciate my side of the enchantment and woo as much as I do, but it, it did make, it, we did have a good laugh about it. So I want you to really think about that and, and really take ownership for the ideas that are coming to you and make the decision if you're going to collaborate with it, or if you're going to turn it back over to God so that it can move on and, and his purpose can be fulfilled through someone else. So that's really what I want to say about all of that. Please go over and share any questions that you have, or even share an experience on when you have entered into a contract with an idea or when you've chosen not to, I think, um, both are equally important. So the third step is permission. Um, I love when people share stories about their past and who they are. Uh, I, it's fun to get like an insight into, um, people's history. And so she did this. That's how she started out permission. And she shared stories about her parents who from the outside world looked very much cookie cutter, but in their own way, they were completely rebellious. They didn't ask to be a creative person. They just did. And there was, I don't know if I marked it. One of the, one of the phrases she had about her mom was just so amazing. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, she said, uh, she said, uh, talking about her mom, she smiled sweetly at everyone and always acted like a total cooperator, but then she shaped her own world exactly to her liking while nobody was looking like what a cool way to think about your mom is it being that total rebel. And I, I truly do believe so much of us have that inner rebel inside of us. And I think sometimes we use rebel uh, as a negative phrase when in reality, I think it really is just embracing the inner person that we're meant to be that the unique skills and, and gifts that we have that God has given to us. And when we embrace her, it is almost a rebellious act because it makes other people uncomfortable when somebody is confident, when somebody is engaging with their ideas and having the courage to go out there. So there is a rebellious part of you where you have to start, you have to stop asking for permission and start creating the life exactly how you want it to be. Um, and so I, I really liked that, that she shared that example about her parents and how much that shaped her life as a writer. And I think it's important for us to realize as women is that we have that effect on people. My very first coach I hired was because she was unapologetically herself. It was the biggest breath of fresh air I had ever seen. <laughs> I had never met a woman like her. And I knew immediately that something was different about her. It was because she was not asking for permission to be herself. She just was. And, and that's really when we get to that spot where we can start creative being our most creative self is when we stop asking. So she goes on to say, um, she says at the end of the day, talking now about herself as a writer, she says, I do what I do because I like doing it. And <laughs> Like, it seems so simple, <laughs> but it's so hard for us as women is really doing something for the sake of pure enjoyment of, of creativity. She said, your own reasons to create are reasons enough merely by pursuing what you love. You may inadvertently help, uh, end up helping us plenty. She said, there is no love, which does not become help, um, which was from a theologian that she's quoting. She says, um, follow, let's see. She says, do whatever you, um, do whatever brings you to life 
then follow your own fascinations, obsessions, and compulsions, trust them, create whatever causes a revolution in your that's powerful. Like when you think about what it is that stirs inside of you, a revolution in your heart, like that really hits home to me. Um, when, well, so yeah. So then she goes on to talk a little bit about how many people want to go to school in order to prove their legitimacy as part of that permission. Instead of trusting the skills that they have, they're asking for permission from the outside world by having a piece of paper. And she is very clear that she's not against school. (laughs) She's not, she's not against higher education. She's against that. People are seeking that to prove themselves, to gain permission, to be who they, who they are meant to be. And I, I really saw this in myself. Um, I, I, one of the reasons why I didn't start my business when I did was because it was not a master's program. And I was convinced in order for me to be successful, in order for me to help the people I wanted to, that I needed a master's degree. And that held me up for a really, really like years that stopped me in in producing the idea and, and the prompting that I felt. And I remember getting to that point where it was like, you know, I I do have life experiences. And I had a lot of people tell me that I was helping them just in my everyday life. And I thought, you know, I I do have experiences. I'm just going to start talking about those experiences. Well, one of those was uh, I had worked from home for many years and I felt very embarrassed um, to share my knowledge about working from home. But what was so fascinating was at one point I shifted and I stopped asking for permission to speak about it. And I started openly talking about it. Somebody had approached me to create a business workshop that, uh, that they could sell to businesses. And I, I I couldn't even respond back for a long time because I thought, who in the world am I to be able to share the things that I do with my family and to make working from home really possible because I am a full-time mom as well. I, I don't, I'm a, I don't like that phrase, primary caregiver. Well, let's go with that phrase. But one of the shifts that I remember having in my brain was like, I have a decade of experience doing this and I know my stuff. And that was the first shift. I may not have a master's degree, but I have 12 years of experience in doing this work and I know my stuff. So I was able to create from that thought. I was able to create whole workshops that, that we marketed and sold. And I presented to companies And it was so cool. Like it was already in the works when COVID hit and everybody was working from home. So that's really not where my full passion lies, my creative living. I I really enjoy doing things like this and not presenting to a company. Um, But it was cool to see how when I stopped, when I gave myself permission and I stopped worrying about having those qualifications um, to prove my legitimacy, suddenly every like creative aspects started to flow through me a lot more. So the next one she talks about is persistence. And, um, she said, (coughs) excuse me. Uh, she said, persistence is, is not just grinding away. (laughs) The one thing she talks about here is how we are addicted to suffering. And I thought that phrase was really interesting. Um, going back to, we can, um, we can really, uh, use our excuses to hold ourselves back. We can really prove how suffering is meant to be. (laughs) And I fell in this camp for so long. Please don't stay in this camp. (laughs) If I could tell you anything about um, my journey and creative living, it's that suffering does no good. And uh, to be clear, there is growth that happens that is uncomfortable, that there are things that we experience in life that help us become more like God. That is not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is thinking suffering is the way to creative living. And she said, when you are addicted to suffering, you are using it as, um, almost as your armor, like everything you do, you got to toil in order for it to be good. She talks about a lot of people kind of like the no pain, no gain type gain type mentality that a lot of artists, they, they talk about, I've got two, um, 
two actors that I coach and they both talk about how different they are now after coaching, because there is this, the, the starving, struggling, um, actor mentality where they all want to think that their life is harder than the rest of the world. And they use that as like a badge of honor. I, and I was there for a long time. And what really changed that for me was one to recognize that, um, one, I just didn't like being here. Like it just didn't feel good to my soul. And two, recognizing that, that, working in partnership with God should never create suffering. It should never be, um, a place for us to, um, to feel heavy. Like life is meant to be joyful. God created this, um, experience for us to learn and to grow and to become more like him. And that includes hardships, but it also includes so much happiness and joy. So when we're holding that badge of honor to our suffering, we're missing out on the the joy and the gratitude and the beauty of of the world around us. One of the things she talks about in the book is to recognize, she said, it's not just, um, she, it's not just to recognize the patterns of suffering. It's to recognize your patterns and the way your brain thinks in the moment. So the way I think about this is I think about it as, um, like a cycle. Okay. We're going to put these little arrows where at any point we're moving through this cycle. Now we can get stuck in one of these cycles that we're going to call a low value, or we are going, uh, actually, you know, I'm going to call it something different. I call it that like when I'm coaching clients, but I think in terms of purpose and hitting this home is called the suffering cycle. Okay. Where you have an idea, let's say you have an idea and you go in contract with that idea. And then you decide all the things that are hard. And then instead of looking at this, you stay in that and you give up. This is the suffering cycle. Everybody goes through this, myself included, where we can get to the suffering cycle. We, and, and this is what makes it very hard for us to be persistent in our, in our goals. But the alternative, we're going to call it the persistent cycle. We have an idea. We go in contract with it. We recognize the things that are hard and we, um, we work through them. And there's lots of ways to work through those, just to be clear. Um, we work through those and we, I would also say we find the joy and we keep going. Okay. Recognizing the difference between when, which cycle you're in and what it looks like when the hard things happen, what do you do now? I know my pattern very clearly. As soon as things get hard, I start making excuses about why life is harder for me than other people. The other thing that I start doing is I start staying up even later. I start eating all the chocolate in the house. (laughs) Like it sounds so silly to say out loud, but I do it all the time when I'm stuck in the suffering cycle. And what I do is I end up taking myself out of the game because I'm afraid of failure. So I fail even before I tried the thing. It's like, I know this isn't going to work. My life is so hard. It's much harder than everyone else. I'm just going to pull myself out. So I don't even have to think about it. It's going to be easier that way. (laughs) Trust me. It's not easier that way. I've learned many times. It's not easier that way. Whereas if you're staying in the persistent cycle, you go back and you're trusting. And that's what we're going to talk about next is you're trusting that you're working through, you're learning the exact things that you are meant to learn to become the person you are meant to be. And that's one of the ideas that I, she also, I can't remember which section it was where she talked about, we're not giving birth to these ideas. We're going in contract with them and they're giving birth to us. That's a very different shift on, on when we're presenting these ideas out into the world and we're working collaboration, we are for sure going to go through hard things because we are rebirthing who we are and becoming who we're meant to be. And we keep going. That's going to be the the biggest difference when you're in a persistent cycle. So then she, she goes on to talk about, I'm actually going to leave this up because I think we'll come back to that. Um, 
she talks about trust and the way she talks about it is, is do you love your, you know, whatever, do you love your creativity? Do you love your writing? Do you love, you know, whatever, like you can sub anything in, into that. And then she stops and asks, she says, do you believe it loves you back? Do you believe your creativity loves you back? That's where trust comes in on, on a much deeper level. She said, creativity isn't meant to bring us pain. Uh, and, and the only way to shift out of that is to really get curious. And, and that's the other part that I would put right here is that the only way to get from like a persistent to, or excuse me, from a suffering to a persistent cycle is to find the joy and get curious and trust that you're learning the lessons that you are meant to. She said, this is when you truly do, um, move in collaboration and live from a very creative, creative space. So then I'll, I'll just mention, cause we just have a couple minutes left. The, the last thing that she talks about is divinity. And she talks about a fun experience where, um, the, the Bali dancers, they had a very sacred dance and everybody was coming to see this sacred dance and all the Western West Westerners, there we go. I got it out. Um, all the Westerners were coming to see that, that they were crowding all of the temples in order to see this dance. So the Bali people, um, Balinese, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the Balinese people decided, well, we're just going to come to the resorts where they're already staying and do the dance. But then the Westerners threw a fit that, oh, we're taking your, the sacred out of your temple. You can't do that. Well, it didn't translate into, you know, the different culture and language very well. So what the Bali individuals, so the people decided is that we'll create a different dance that we can do for you, keep you happy. We keep our sacred dance in the temple. But what she said in the book was that suddenly the dance that they made up, you know, it wasn't sacred. It was just a made up dance. They moved and, and made it so creative that she said it was almost transcendent in it, when they did it, it became more sacred because they were the individuals performing it. And suddenly that experience, they, they, they took those dances and brought them back to the temple as the sacred dances. So the whole point of all of that was to explain that our, our creativity is completely sacred and not sacred at all. And living with that paradox, I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to read the last sentence where she talks about this. Um, actually I may not have marked it. Hold on really quick. Um, so she said, creativity is sacred and it is not sacred. Uh, we toil alone. So she's talking about the, um, the, the paradoxes that creative living, uh, in, uh, creative living happens like inside of us. So we toil alone, but we're accompanied by spirits. We're terrified and we're brave. Art is a crushing chore and a wonderful privilege. Only when we are our most playful, uh, only when we are at our most playful, uh, can divinity finally get serious with us, make space for these paradoxes to be equally true inside of your soul. And I promise you can make anything. The treasures that are hidden inside of you are hoping you will say yes. And I, I truly do believe that, um, at the, the human brain doesn't like paradoxes. It's almost like does not compute. Like our brain likes, feels like it's going to break. So what I do in these moments where I think about, I can be terrified and I, I always mentally put my hands out in front of my face. Um, or I can toil alone and there are spirits that accompany me. My work is sacred and it's not at all. It's, it, it doesn't matter in the world. Like really that comes down to, and I hold both. And it's like, I look and feel the emotions. Of, and when I'm ready, I just put them both in like separate pockets. Like I imagine myself just tucking them into my pocket and letting them stay there. That's how you, ex uh, how you can create an expansive feeling inside of your body so that these paradoxes can exist in order to create big magic, in order to, to work in partnership with these ideas that want to collaborate with you, being able to in, uh, bring in that sacredness, but also that whimsical and that playfulness, being able to trust that these ideas are be, are bigger than we are, uh, that they are 
God's purpose and we get to engage with, with them if we so choose and, and recognizing that, that when we're persistent with all of that, and when we trust him, magical things start to happen. And I truly do believe like from the depths of my soul, that this is, this is how we achieve our greatest potential is when we engage with every single one of these, um, these, uh, times when we choose to collaborate, like, yeah, excuse me, ideas, when we choose to engage with an idea, it is how we discover our hidden, our, our hidden gifts. And we can present that back to the world to bless and serve and help all of God's children. So that is big magic. I would love to know your thoughts. Anything that stood out to you, you can go over to the chat box um, and let me know uh, what you enjoyed about the book or about anything we talked about. And I'll leave it open for just a couple minutes um, of conversation. So while you're doing that, I wanted to get your opinion. So I have not planned actually the book for next month is the happiness project with, I think, which I think is really fun. Um, you will also see, um, an email for a webinar that I'm going to do before Jan. Well, I'm debating if it's going to be in December or January, but it's going to be called how, how to make goals, not suck because <laughs> I'm, I'm a recovering goal hater. And I would like to share information with you that goals don't have to suck. So that webinar will be coming out. Um, it's just something fun that I'm going to do because especially the first of the year where we're all setting goals, I really want to make sure we're, we're set up to be successful and not to have them suck. Um, yes. So yes, you will be surprised. Everybody hates making goals. I, I totally, because I honestly believe the reason why we hate making goals is because we're doing it wrong. And the way the culture we have set around oh, it, can you see my mouth? Like, uh, like I hate it. I hate it. But when I realized like the reason why we do goals and to create a, a system that works for every person, suddenly the goals became more fun because goals really are working in partnership with God to bring these ideas to pass. And, and, and it becomes a much more fun, beautiful, playful process than like, you know, every feeling like the world is like coming down on you. Um, expectation leads to disappointment. That's my problem with goals. Yes. And, and that I think, uh, yeah, that is so huge. Um, thank you, Nicole, for sharing that because, um, the expectation of these goals, <laughs> like we will work on that very much, um, that we address that so much. So be on the lookout for that. If you would like to join that, of course, you're more than welcome to. So I'm going to read. So if anybody has suggestions on books you want us to do for this next year, um, let me know because I'm open. I'm planning it all out. I'm going to read a couple of the ones that I have planned out. Um, but if there's others that seem interesting to you that you've been wanting to get to, let me know. Cause I always try and keep my finger on the pulse of where everybody's at and, um, being able to find fun books. So a couple of the books I thought about, um, was untamed that's Glennon Doyle, um, seven habits for highly effective people. That's an older one. Um, but still very relevant. Um, the originals, um, that's Adam Grant, think and grow rich, which is like one of the most famous books talking about money beliefs, which is really fascinating. Um, the four tendencies. So that's Gretchen Rubin. So we're doing the happiness project and then four tendencies is her other book. I really want to make sure we include that. Um, I do like trying to find books that are, um, by women authors. And I will tell you, it's hard, surprisingly hard to find, um, books written by women. Um, I like to celebrate women and especially in the self-help, um, genre, there's not a lot, which is really surprising. So I do try and include those books. Um, another one that I've really thought about, there's a couple, um, like the body keeps score or waking the tiger, which talks about, um, how trauma is stored in our body, because it's important to recognize working with our body and the trauma that we have, trauma, meaning like big things or like a mean comment that a girl said to you in junior high, like your body processes both the same way. Those can be huge roadblocks when you're answering the calling and, and becoming who you're meant to be. So those are a couple of fun books. Um, the magic art of tidying up, um, Marie Kondo. I love that book. Super easy read, but it's fun to think about it. Not in terms of like decluttering our house, 
but decluttering our mind. Um, you love Marie kind of, I do too. Like, <laughs> I think she is. So when I watched her on Netflix, she is adorable, really, really cool person. Um, so yes, she's a really fun one, um, that I, that I really love to bring and put it into like, how does decluttering our house, not only fit with our calling and who we're meant to be, but create systems that work with us. So tell me, tell me your thoughts. You can even actually, I'm going to go ahead and end this recording. And then if you guys want, if you're comfortable, you can unmute. Um, so you're going to hear it in just a second.